You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Alexandra Monier back on the show with me today to talk about a brand new project that she has that uh, just came out a few days ago. It's Black Canary Breaking Silence, and it is the Black Canary origin story from the DC Icons uh, series. If you have been following uh, th- this series of books for a while, it it's a really interesting project where DC Comics um, it is uh, getting well-known authors to write sort of origin stories in in prose form uh, for some of their uh, you know most well-known characters. And Alexandra has stepped in to do uh, the origin story for Black Canary. And what an awesome book! Uh, welcome back to the show, Alexandra. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me back. Absolutely. Um, so. How familiar uh, were you, Alexandra, with the the DC canon and its uh, cast of characters and Black Canary specifically? How familiar were you with this character? I was definitely very familiar with the whole DC canon. Um, growing up, I was very well aware of, you know, the the trinity of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Oh, yeah. Um, so... Definitely a fan from the beginning of all things DC. Um, And I knew of Black Canary, but she was always a little bit more. I I hadn't yet seen her in a starring vehicle. So, for example, you know, I knew her as one of the birds of prey. I knew her as Green Arrow's love interest. And then, of course, she was introduced to an even wider audience with the TV series Arrow. Um, But this was getting this incredible gig of a lifetime to write her YA origin story was the first time I really got to delve into the history of of Black Canary as a character. And, um, you know, just it's really an incredibly rich canon there with so many different alternate histories and so many uh, team ups she's had with other iconic DC characters. So um this is a long way of saying that, yes, I was definitely <laughs> familiar and a fan before, but it was really through writing this book that I became much more um, entrenched in all things Black Canary. So, Alexandra, we spoke earlier. Um, well, it was last year um, because when people are hearing this, it's January. Um, <laughs> so it was it was the beginning of last year. We spoke about your book, The Life Below. And if I remember right. um, we had this great conversation about YA books in particular and the audience for them and, and how some books transcend those um, age barriers uh, that that these labels that we put on them, YA and sometimes middle grade. And I think we we even talked about like Harry Potter and how, uh, you know, those early Harry Potter books are middle grade. And, uh, you know, we have people of literally all ages that read those books and they connect with them. And even though the characters are young and their experiences are, are you know, filtered through the eyes of young people, there's still stories that that uh, that that just transcend that. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that's very interesting about comics. And, you know, modern comics are maybe a little more mature. Uh, and, uh, you know, are, are targeted toward maybe a little bit older audience. But, you know, every comics fan that I know got into comics when they were a young person. There's something about these kinds of stories that uh, that that really appeal to young people. And then you kind of latch onto those characters and carry them through life. Um, What what about these characters and, and Black Canary specifically? Um, do you, do you think, um, uh, is such a draw for a young person? Well, I think for, 
pretty much anyone, but especially when, when you're younger, there is that, there is that sort of fantasy we all have that, you know, we might seem perfectly ordinary, but deep down there's something incredibly extraordinary about, about us. And I think that's true of everybody. Um, in reality, I think we are all extraordinary, but um, superheroes kind of take that to the next level where you get to experience that vicarious thrill of like the boy or girl next door suddenly having these superhuman capabilities. And oftentimes it's someone that, you know, like in the case of Peter Parker is someone that had been kind of, you know, on the fringes and ignored and not the cool kid. And so I feel like there, there's just that wish fulfillment aspect of, you know, somebody that you know, has their own human insecurities. And then suddenly they find out there's this whole other incredible superhuman side to them. Um, so I think that's really the main draw is just that thing in all of us that wants to and strives to be, you know, more than ordinary. You you brought up the character of Peter Parker, and I'm, I'm so glad that you did, because one of the oldest arguments in in the the world of comics is this DC versus Marvel and um, DC has the the Trinity that you talked about with Batman yeah. Superman Wonder Woman and uh, Marvel has uh, of course the Marvel Cinematic Universe which we're all familiar with at this point yeah. and characters like the Avengers and Spider Man and we get Peter Parker and one thing that's always been said about Marvel comics is that well these characters seem to be more grounded and and rooted in real life and peter parker has has real problems that a, a real teenager or you know young person could um could uh commiserate with and you know it's it's more difficult to think of wonder woman or superman uh in those terms um but yet dc is is full of characters that are are like peter parker and um you know black canary is one of those um yeah. What what uh, um, what is it about her character that makes her so relatable? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of um, DC characters, actually, that are that do have backstories that are more grounded and that aren't necessarily as sci fi fantasy. I mean, even just, um, you know, or not Selena, literal gods. Right. Like <laughs> Selena Kyle, Catwoman, you know, Bruce Wayne. I, I mean, I think those start out very grounded stories. So. Um, anyway, uh, so with, with Black Canary, yes, um, you know, when we begin the novel, she is your kind of sort of quintessential high school senior that does feel like she doesn't belong both at school, but also in this society at large that is Gotham City. And I've written a dystopian version of Gotham that is very oppressive. It's ruled over by the Court of Owls, which is this sinister, shadowy organization that is very patriarchal. And it's all about keeping the power concentrated among these very elite few men. And um, they have basically slapped down some major, major restrictions on women to kind of keep them in their place. And um, it's these restrictions that Dinah is secretly fighting against. So, yeah, I mean, at the beginning of the book, there is there is nothing like superhuman or superhero about her other than just, you know, she's got this incredible sort of fire inside her that wants more than what is being kind of given to, to her and to all the girls and women of Gotham city. Um, and then it's over the course of the book that she does discover something very unique and, and special about her that is a superpower. Um, but even that is, is her voice. It's not like, you know, she got a hammer from the gods, you know what I mean? Right. Like, or like, it's something that is literally just within her. And so that was really fun to be able to write, um, to, yeah, to be able to write a superhero story that also feels like you could see something like this in a local high school. And, and sometimes the best superpower uh, is that that uh, that will um, yeah. that drive uh, that uh, that powers people even before superpowers come in this 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 fortitude inside that that really is the superpower that we all connect with. 
Totally. Absolutely. So um, I know that you had been um, a fan of science fiction, fantasy, and your your book that we talked about last time, The Life Below, um, is this great sci-fi um, world. How how were you approached by by DC to uh, to tackle Black Canary? Um, you know, at at on at first blush, it may seem like what you uh, normally wrote about or had uh, had done. Uh, maybe didn't dovetail that well, but then when you start looking at the the project side by side, I I definitely see a connection there. But how how did you get brought into this world? Yeah, so it was actually thanks to um, the book that came before the one that you and I spoke about, the Life Below. So the Life Below was the sequel to my 2018 uh, sci-fi young adult novel, The Final Six. And um, through that book, I got sent to a lot of different comic cons and just different kind of fan conventions and book festivals. And so at one of them, WonderCon in Anaheim, um, which is a fabulous uh, convention for all things fantasy. And um, at that convention, I was introduced to this wonderful editor at DC Comics. And I ended up crossing paths with her and another one of her colleagues at a few other events after that, because it was just sort of like that season of book festivals and uh, comic conventions. So I was at a bunch of those and so were they. And so we got to know each other. And um, because of my music background, I started my career actually as a teen pop singer before I became an author. Um, through that connection to music, they thought of me for Black Canary. And one of these two great editors at DC said, um, oh, you should really think about writing a YA Black Canary story with both your YA sci-fi career, but also, you know, your musical, your whole musical path makes you a great fit for this character. So I was like, oh, wow, that's an amazing idea. One I had never thought of before, but oh my God, like what a dream to get to do that. Right. So I quickly was inspired and came up with a pitch and I wrote it. And initially we were talking about this being a graphic novel. But as I was writing it, I started to really feel like it was a prose novel. And I could just I don't know, the words just kind of all came pouring out of me. And I knew that DC already had this series four books um, called DC Icons with Random House. And um, it was a very kind of high level thing where they had specifically handpicked for number one New York Times bestseller, big name authors, and each of them got to write an iconic uh, DC character. There was Wonder Woman by Leah Bardugo, Batman by Mary Lou, Catwoman by Sarah J. Moss, and Superman by Matt De La Pena. So I was not (laughs) at that caliber yet, um, but I just, I don't know. I had such a feeling about my story and I felt, I just felt like it belonged in the DC icons line. Even if I didn't necessarily feel like I, as an author was there yet, I definitely felt like my story and what I had written was. So I looked in the acknowledgments of the other DC icons books, and I saw that they all thanked the editor, Chelsea Eberly. So I asked my agent to send the pages to her and, um, And it actually worked out. She read them. She loved them, sent them to D.C. and they felt the same way and they made me an offer. So it was the most amazing, amazing thing because it was just like it it was just so awesome to kind of wish for something and reach for something that seemed beyond my grasp and then have them respond and actually give it to me. I love that. Um, (laughs) D.C. DC obviously is a publisher that is known for publishing comics and graphic novels. And, you know, like you uh, mentioned a minute ago that you, you, you thought this project was going to be this, and then, you know, it, it obviously lent itself more toward a prose novel, but what's it like writing prose for a company that is known for their comics work? Like, uh, do they think differently as a company, um, you know, as a prose writer, did, were you bringing things to them that, uh, uh, that's kind of boundary pushing. You know, the the really cool thing about DC is that even though comics are, you know, obviously what they're known for and, and what made them, they have they actually do have a, a great kind of publishing side where there are other prose novels. So it really is the same as writing my other books. I think the only 
major difference in terms of the writing was just knowing that I had to basically get permission for everything I wanted to do, understandably, because these aren't my characters. So, um, you know, they, they looked over my outline before I really committed everything to the page. And then they approved that. And I was really happy because, you know, my story is, I would say it's a little bit boundary pushing in that, um, you know, it's set in a dystopian kind of futuristic Gotham City. So that takes it a little bit outside of, you know, what we're used to seeing while still staying true to kind of the spirit of Gotham. Um, and then also, you know, there's there's a politically charged aspect to it as well. So I was really grateful that they let me follow my gut and follow the story that was kind of calling to me with this. Uh, There really wasn't much management of me in that sense of like, you know, don't write this plot point, plot point, do write that one. There was none of that. If anything, it was just at the end when I had my final draft, DC and Warner Brothers both looked at it and gave me some character notes and really helped me make sure that all the characters, even though I was taking them on a different journey, that they all kind of stay true to, you know, the tenets of their characters in the canon. The Court of Owls um, play heavily into uh, the story here and really set the tone. um, Well, and and the rules of the world in in a lot of ways. Um, Is this the same Court of Owls that uh, Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo uh, came up with uh, about a decade ago? Yes, yes. I actually thank them in my acknowledgments. And there's even the book opens with this like creepy nursery rhyme that uh, Scott (laughs) Snyder wrote um, about the Court of Owls. And so, yeah, um, I was totally inspired by that. I think they created such a great villainous kind of group with with the Court of Owls. And I I kind of almost almost as soon as I came up with my idea, I, I knew I wanted to incorporate Court of Owls as the villains. So they they hand you this character and you get to reimagine in a lot of ways um, her origin story and bring her into the modern world. Uh, Not that she wasn't already, but you you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, And um, sort of, um, you know, get to play in that world. Um, What's the process like for taking an existing character, uh, an IP that's owned by, you know, such a... uh, such an iconic um, brand. Uh, and, and then, you know, like, are there, are, are there restrictions? Is there uh, like a character Bible that they give you? What What is that process like for, for, you know, you getting to get your feet wet and start playing in that world? Yeah. You know, um, I, I really, there wasn't a character Bible or anything. I just did a ton of research myself. I mean, Black Canary has been around since the 1940s. So there was a whole wealth of history to look at in terms of old comics and all the different, you know, she's had her kind of backstory has been retconned a few times. So there's alternate versions of her out there. So if anything, that wealth of material kind of gave me the freedom to sort of I mean, it's not like there was one specific narrative about her that everyone's kind of attached to. So that really gave me the freedom to basically do my own thing and kind of pull what I loved about different versions of her character and kind of pull from that. Like I knew I wanted her to be, you know, the Dinah Lance version of Black Canary, not Dinah Drake. And I knew I wanted her to be the daughter of Dinah Drake and Larry Lance and, you know, things like that. Um, I kind of took what I liked that had been part of her canon, essentially, and then really just made it my own. Um, I I spoke to Lee Bardugo um, when she did the Wonder Woman book, and I've talked oh, with hey. uh, with Gene Lu and Yang uh, when he was writing uh, Superman, uh-huh. and uh, you know they're these iconic characters with such a history. Um, how do you decide? You know what you're going to bring new um, to these characters that, that have um, that have such a history. How how do you make your own mark on a character like this? I think the way I did it was, I mean, first of all, positioning the, you know, the the setting into the near future really helped because I felt like that allowed me to to make it my own and not feel like I was stepping on the toes of anybody else or, you know, other versions of Gotham City. I was sure. kind of bringing us into the future with this. 
Um, and then also, you know, I don't, what was really helpful and cool is that Dinah really hasn't been seen as a teenager. Um, Black Canary has very much kind of been seen as this character in her 20s or older. So just, you know, getting, this really is the very first YA origin story about her. So that that also gave me the freedom to kind of make make it my own. And getting to introduce Dinah and Oliver Queen, the Green Arrow, getting to introduce their relationship in high school instead of, you know, years later when they're introduced in the comics, um, typically like that was really awesome too. Cause it allowed me to kind of retell this love story that so many people are attached to, but get to bring it in earlier and imagine what, what it would have been like if they had met in high school instead of when they were in their twenties. In your book, the court of owls have really, um, uh, instituted a, a severe patriarchy uh over gotham city and and yeah. uh to the point uh that that women are uh not only repressed but um i mean just uh, i can't even put into words what 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 gave you the idea to uh to have them be such an overbearing presence uh and and how does uh, uh how, how do your characters respond so this actually was really taken from my own family background. Um, my family is Iranian. And after the Iranian revolution, these um, these really harsh kind of rules against women were put in place for for basically all all Iranian women. And um, and to this day, they continue to this day you can get severely punished if you are a woman in Iran who sings in public. I mean, it's, it's so hard to believe, but it's true. And um, my grandmother, Monir Vakili, she was this incredible opera singer. She was an opera star. She was, you know, such an iconic woman of Iran. And not only was she their foremost opera singer, but she also she opened and co-founded the first opera company in the country. She opened the first co-ed boarding school to teach kids how to sing classically like her. I mean, she did so many amazing things and the country was, was so just so wonderful and progressive for women. And then all of a sudden, when the 1979 revolution happened, that just all came to this horrible screeching halt. And then it was sort of like the country went so far backwards um, in terms of women's rights and and in terms of a lot of things. But what I'm specifically focusing on here is is women's rights, because that's something that obviously is personal to me and really just something that I grew up knowing what the women in my family had been through and how my grandmother had lost both her country and her career and all these things that she had built. And so when you live in this country, but you have that perspective of knowing what could happen. Um, I was born years after the revolution. I tragically never got to meet my grandmother because she died in a car accident before I was born. And so I just kind of grew up with this legend of her and of who she had been and what she had meant to so many people. And then to grow up in the States and know you know, what was taken away from my grandmother. And it just makes you sort of look at things in a more precarious light. And right. so when I see things happening here in the state that feel and seem like, you know, the beginnings of taking away certain rights and freedoms and choices from women, it starts to kind of make me think more about what happened in Iran and wanting to prevent that here. And so I think this book was me sort of expressing that and exploring all of that on the page. And it's something I've wanted to write about for a long time, what happened to my family and, and our culture and everything. But I think in a way, it's so funny that the most American project ever writing a DC superhero novel is the project where I finally felt like I could safely tackle that because I was able to do it in a way that is in this, you know, sci-fi fantasy kind of story. But it's also talking about deeper things and things that are really relevant today. Absolutely. And it resonates so deeply. Oh, um, one great thing about the book is the the uh, supporting characters in the book. Okay. And Barbara <laughs> Gordon uh, plays a, a pretty pivotal role in the book. 
Um, and it's interesting to see that that Dinah realizes that, you know, when she thinks she's all alone, there are heroes there um, yeah. and, and it, people that are that are actually working on the problem. And 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 it, that happens to us, you know, all the time when you think you're all alone and then you look and you say, oh, there are other people involved in the in the struggle and the, the fight already. Um, what? What was it like to get to play with some of those other characters besides just the character of Dinah? Oh, my gosh. That was such a dream come true. I mean, there was a moment when I was writing, um, particularly there's one scene, which I won't say too much about because I don't want to you know, be too spoiler heavy. But there is one scene where they do go down to the old to one of the old bat caves. And I did have this moment where I said to my husband, I was like, I'm actually getting to do this for my job. Like, this is so fun. <laughs> um, it really felt like the most, like, I don't know. The only thing I can compare it to is like getting to write fan fiction, like as work. It was right. just the most fun thing ever. And I had a blast, like looking at Dinah's kind of, um, you know, all the different relationships she's had over the course of the comics and different mediums and deciding, okay, what are the pivotal relationships for her? What are the ones that I love seeing kind of in different forms time and again? And that's how I settled on the characters like Barbara Gordon, like Sandra Wusan, Lady Shiva. Um, yeah, that's that's how I I kind of decided was I looked at who are the the characters that are a, you know, the most compelling to write about, but also who have had the biggest impact on Dinah over the course of the comics. And how do I want to reintroduce them here? So Alexandra, um, what do you, what do you top a project like this with? Um, you know, <laughs> th this uh, is, is obviously out in stores now. Everybody can get their hands on it. And um, if we know publishing and the way that works, this has been off of your desk for quite a while. And uh, while it goes through all of the the publishing machinations, um, yeah. so what are you working on now and what's going to come next from you? And and, you know, once you get to dip your feet into a project like this, how do you continue doing what you what you have been doing? Well, I am so, so grateful because I got another incredible, iconic, uh, major character that I get to write. So I think it would have been really hard to go from Black Canary to just, I don't know, the blank page because she's so amazing. <laughs> and um, the most amazing sort of second gig to follow that is that Disney has hired me to write a YA historical fantasy novel about Princess Jasmine. So I'm just about to start on that, which I'm really excited about. And then I'm also working on um, adapting some of my original books to uh, to screenplay and um, working on some new original ideas as well. So uh, Jasmine is the one that I am able to announce right now that comes out in 2022. Um, but definitely, I hope to have more things to be able to share with you soon, too. So much fun. I can't <laughs> wait to see what you do with Jasmine. That is that's going to be you. such a phenomenal project. Thank you um, so much. Hopefully I'll be back on your show in a couple of years talking about that. We fully expect you to. Um, <laughs> the new book, Black Canary Breaking Silence, available everywhere now. Been out for a couple of days now. Uh, you can get it in hardcover or Kindle edition uh, or audiobook. I'll bet the audiobook for this is a lot of fun. I can't wait to to listen to that. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. We're going to put links to all those in the show notes uh, of the episode to make it easy for people to find it. Um, Alexandra, uh, tell people where they can find you uh, online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do. Yes, definitely uh, follow me on Instagram at Alexandra Monir, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A-M-O-N-I-R. And on Twitter at Timeless Alex. I'm also on Facebook at Alexandra Monir Author. And um, definitely check out my main website, alexandramonier.com, which has um, all sorts of, you know, book related content on there. Um, I did write three original songs for Black Canary, and one of them I was able to record. And uh, Penguin Random House has it up on their Spotify or not Spotify. I'm sorry. Uh, SoundCloud. Penguin Random House has it up on their SoundCloud. Um, and I linked to that on my website as well. 
so fun. We'll put links to all those in the show notes and make it easy for folks to find. Uh, Alexandra, always a pleasure to uh, to get to chat. Black Canary Breaking Silence out everywhere now. Go grab your copy. Uh, Alexandra, thank you for taking time to come back on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun as always. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career, meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels, along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden cost, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com